hello everyone. Uh, this is our third panel on uh, trips and in general how to use, how to bring forward the vacation rental industry for the new internet, Web3, blockchain, whatever you want to call it. And uh, today we have two guests who are pretty technical. Um, there is a Clement Lesage, is it correct? Yeah. Lesage, okay, Lesage. Yeah, from Lesage, great, from uh, who is French, but is in uh, in Lisboa, in Portugal, and uh, who is working on a project called Cleros, and I'm going to tell you about. And uh, we had and we lost Marco, but I'm sure he's going to come back in a minute. Marco Crota from Milan, he's uh, an expert in blockchain and an educator, and uh, he's a very well known figure in uh, in the blockchain space in Italy. So he has a, a blog and uh, a YouTube channel where he teaches people to, uh, well, everything about blockchain basically. So he's a very successful channel. And um, so that's how we're gonna organize this. We, we have a subject here, which is how are we going to take decisions and especially how are we going to manage disputes on booking portals like trips or in general so um on on the new internet which basically means for people who don't know too much what we're talking about how are we gonna do this without having a company behind this so the benchmark is airbnb airbnb deals with disputes like the guest breaks something and doesn't want to pay or the host doesn't deliver the promise and we have this kind of disputes in these transactions of, of like booking a place and when something wrong happens something goes wrong someone has to take a decision and in this case airbnb as a resolution center basically airbnb as a, a part of the company where they decide who gets you know who gets uh, some money or, or who gets punished etc etc uh, this dispute management is really one of the biggest added values for Airbnb hosts and guests because somebody is in charge. Before this, if something went wrong, the, the money was in the hands of the, of the host or the property manager and the guest had to hope that um, his you know, power through the review was enough to, uh, to be protected, right? But with Airbnb, everything became much fast, much easier. So there's a problem, go to daddy and go to mommy. They're going to take care of it, right? And this is great. It made, made things much easier. But at the same time, it, made, it gave less power to the parties, especially to the hosts. And uh, what we've seen is that in, at the beginning, when Airbnb wanted more hosts, it was much more understanding on the host side. So hosts were winning the cases more often. But in the last couple of years, guests win the cases more often because probably because Airbnb wants more guests now. It's kind of the situation. Uh, still, that's the benchmark. This is the best way these bits are managed. Now, in trips, we want trips to be something without a company behind. Like if there's a dispute, the network has to take a decision, right? And very early on, when we were writing the, the white paper, we discovered uh, Cleros, so Clement and, and his colleagues, which is trying to decentralize the decision making. Basically, they are trying to say, don't worry, you don't need a company. The network will take care of it. There are ways to do this with a network. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave Clement explain uh, what you're doing as, as a company, as a blockchain company, and how you would deal with this kind of booking platforms uh, disputes. So uh, just, just to finish and, and introduce Cleros. Cleros is a company born in, I think, 2017. Is that correct? Or earlier, 17? Yeah. You did an ICO. It means you raise money through this new way of raising money. Um, a few millions at a time, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, like 
two to three million yeah okay two three million dollars and then this money changes because of the value of uh, ether because you collected ether and not dollars but so you you basically managed to ride the wave of ICOs uh, ICOs for those who don't know is and was like a craze in 2017 where you would say give me your ether which is one cryptocurrency and I give you my tokens which are not worth anything today but they're gonna be worth in the future and it's been a, mostly scams right but a few of them were serious and Claris is one of them right you you got the money you didn't run away to Barbados or anywhere you're still there and you're working and you've been working very seriously for for three years now at least and uh, so we're very curious to know what what you've done so far where you stand and and then I have we have here Marco too because Marco is not involved in in ICOs or directly these kind of projects Marco to keep us with feet on the ground and say you know and give us a bit of a balance here and so Clement what have you done so far what are you actually offering nowadays and then we can go later on what's going to be what's going to come in the future what's the situation so, with Claros basically so we built uh, Claros which is a decentralized court for smart contracts so let's let's take a simple smart contract uh, well let's take it also related to uh, uh, to travel and uh, booking uh, places. So you are Alice and you want to rent uh, some uh, some uh, room uh, uh, to Bob, like in, a, in something like Airbnb, but in the decentralized version of Airbnb. If you pay Bob directly, well, you have no recourse. He has the money and if you want uh, to get your money back, you're gonna need to go into a state court. And if it's a complete scam and the place does not even exist, uh, it may even be in another country and you, you've just lost your money. So there is some quite a problem uh, to be addressed here. I gave an example in the travel industry, but it's not just a travel industry problem. It's a world web problem uh, where uh, people sometimes are not just nice and they try to, to take advantage of other people. Uh, even if they are nice, sometimes you have a legitimate disagreement uh, where uh, even if people are not malicious, they both have different point of view uh, and uh, they disagree on all some uh, unusual situations should be resolved. So for that, we made Keros, which is a, a court. And if you have a dispute, which is raised into this court, we will have some jurors which are drawn. So the jurors, uh, they are token holders and a chance to be drawn is proportional to the amount of token that you have staked in this particular court. So for example, you could say, okay, I want to solve travel dispute. I'm gonna stake a 1000 token in this uh, travel dispute court. And if a case arise, one token is gonna be picked. And if it's mine, I'm gonna be a juror in this case. So juror are gonna look at evidence of both parties. So for example, if we have uh, Bob trying to scam Alice and the housing does not exist, uh, well, is going to be asked to put some, uh, some picture uh, and to show that it was actually a legitimate uh, housing. And Alice is going to show a picture of the address and is going to show that there is no one there. Or if there is someone, this someone is definitely not Bob. With this information, the juror can make a decision. And in this case, they should vote to, to uh, refund Alice. Juror, uh, so let, yeah. let me interrupt you. Is it one juror or several? Oh, it's a parameter. You can put one juror or you can put 500 juror. Okay. Uh, that's um, to the DAP developer to determine how much juror they want. Um, you can always appeal. So even if you start with one juror, you may want to start with one juror because uh, to avoid arbitration costs. And if you're not uh, happy with the result, uh, you can pay more to get more juror uh, in, a, in an appeal. So w why do I want to be a juror? Because I have to put some money at stake and uh, I want to be a juror because I, I earn money, right? Because you earn arbitration fees, yeah. So it's basically, a, I could be, as a job, as a job of the future, I could be a juror in Claros. Well, you already have a few people uh, doing that. Oh, it's, that's interesting. Are they making not, money? Um, I don't, and now it's not, uh, like current day, it may not be enough just to make a living. That depends on usage. Uh, during peak of usage, that would have been enough to, uh, to live uh, normally in a European country. Oh, so you're say. telling me that, sorry to interrupt you, so we keep it also a bit more alive and interesting, but 
because every you know every five seconds you are throwing down big 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 new things that are really hard to to, to swallow for, for for most people uh, you you live basically in a different world clement you, you live in 10 years from from now right so let me help people listen with uh, kind of understand what we're talking about and i do this by trying to explain the same thing and, and, and see if I understood correctly. So I could be in the future a juror and my job is a juror uh, on many cases on the blockchain through Clarus and make my living out of it, right? So you could do it this way, but I guess for most people, it may be some uh, complementary income. Like, I don't know, you're, you're taking a train and you have a lot of time where you have nothing to do. You're gonna get uh, uh, your tablet and you're gonna solve a few well, cases there. This, this is one of the arguments I tell when I talk about the, the panel we are planning in trips. It's like, because people can do this in their spare time and when they have half an hour free and, or when they feel like this, probably it's not gonna be, it's gonna be very efficient because you're getting time, which is basically of, of little value, the guy in the train or the girl in the train, spent on something which is of great value. So. I will. I may be willing to do this for cheap because I don't have to get a car and go to an office. I can do it during my, you know, trip on the train. So yeah, even if I get a little money, it's fine. That is, is this gonna keep costs down in your opinion? Well, I think what is gonna keep costs down is that uh, you don't need to set up uh, like uh, some offices to recruit some moderators. Uh, you don't have recruitment costs. Uh, you have access to the world, pool of the world, so you don't specifically need to uh, to pay people in countries where it's going to be like, if you want to pay someone in the US, it's going to be way more expensive and it's not necessarily going to be uh, better than someone in, in Portugal. Uh, so I think uh, the fact that it's really open and really easy to, to start being a juror uh, is going to be what can keep the cars down compared to having to create your own moderator facility. Uh, you're, you're on mute? Yeah, sorry. Who decides the price of uh, how much I'm going to get this if, if I'm a juror for a specific case? So that's a parameter which is by a court. So the court say, okay, I can rule on all those kind of cases and that's going to be the price uh, per juror that uh, you're going to pay. So if we connect to Kleros to have our disputes and trips managed, we can define one dispute earns you that, that kind of money. Uh, you can ask to create a court for this specific purpose and uh, set up the, the value that will be paid to each year. Okay. Uh, let me ask Marco so far, what do you think, Marco, about this? this whole thing? I didn't give Clement the whole time to explain the whole thing, but uh, what is your first feedback about this? Well, I think that definitely this can work because actually what you are doing is basically um, what what we see sometimes in uh, the movies from the United States where they have a, a jury coming from people from the street, like ordinary guys that has to uh, provide their opinion on something that happened. And in this case, what you're doing is basically if you're uh, applying this to trips, you are uh, probably um, having a mix of people that are hosts and guests. So people that uh, are uh, familiar with what had, is happening in those situations. So they, they already have some experience on how to judge the different nuances of the fact that may happen. Um, it, is, uh, um, it is also very interesting, the fact that you are not requiring to have somebody which is uh, um, doing this as a job, as they might have somehow some skin in the game, for example, or they might try to uh, be more more condescent to the host rather than the guest. Um, and this also adds up to the, the system being balanced. So if you have the, the right amount of uh, uh, random choices in between the people who's going to be part of, uh, of the, the jurors and you have uh, a system that actually can work. It, of course, now, if you, if you have uh, three jurors is one thing. If I, th I think I think we lost Marco. You still there, Clement? Yeah, I'm still there. Okay, so I'm gonna just ask you. Uh, Marco was telling about like the the to have a balance. We in trips we're planning to give like to have a kind of algorithm which chooses 
the, the jurors based on, for instance, if they are hosts or guests. So to keep like, we want five people. So three, three guests and two hosts or vice versa. And then at least two or three from the same city where this happens. Is this something you told, you told about or not? No, so Karas is more uh, a cool. So Marco, we lost you. And I asked you a question and uh, yeah, yep. you go ahead. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Sorry, my, my browser keep crashing on me, so I had to restart it over. But uh, as I was saying, the system it's um, it, it, it's sound. Um, you see, the, the the funny thing is that when you work on um, on the blockchain space, uh, you always have to think about who is going to do something wrong uh, on purpose, who is going to try to steal or take advantage of other people. So uh, this is uh, like. Uh, um, the, the mentality they have, did you have in the background? So every project that you start to analyze when you talk about blockchain application, always start by thinking who is going to be the one that's going to uh, run away with the money or take the jack jackpot and leave and so on. So uh, litigation, actually, if you uh, if you look, look at uh, all those things under the um, computer science aspect, the thing is that um, the blockchain actually is a litigation platform basically that it means that uh, all the miners and all the users that are using that blockchain have to agree on something uh, of course it's very easy to do that with cryptocurrency with data with the numbers something that is born inside the blockchain and can be uh, evaluated in the blockchain uh, and uh, is uh, subject to a uh, digital signature um, it's harder if you want to do with stuff that happens in the real world well the blockchain cannot get to but this basically is exactly what the blockchain was meant to be that is exactly the problem that the blockchain is trying to solve okay i lost you guys a little bit at the beginning so uh, i apologize for that um i was asking uh, clement can we envision a way in which we decide that we have out of five people three guests and two hosts or vice versa and three of them from the same city. Can we have an algorithm which picks judges? Or is there a way to pick judges according to their profile? No, no, so Claros, it's an external court. It's not uh, uh, like a, co a court of a specific community of a specific DAP or a specific city. Um, when, uh, when you sue someone uh, in a, like in a state court, uh, you're not going to ask that the judge is going to be from uh, this particular city and the judge should have been uh, an Airbnb client or an Airbnb host. So that's more akin to, to state court on that compared to community court uh, like, the eBay, like the experience they made uh, in eBay. So, but um, you said we can create, a, we can create a, a jury. Who can create a jury? Anyone? So you can, uh, you can create a court and on the court, you're going to determine what are the skills which are required to uh, arbitrate in this court. And you're going to so, determine how much they're going to be paid per case. Uh, you determine the, 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 the skills, but then how is there a way for, to know that people actually have those skills? Or is it based That's, on a review system later on? How would you know that the people who join as jury, jurors do have those skills? So that fits economic incentive. So Keros is based on a shading coin mechanism uh, where basically if you tend to be coherent with the other juror, you're going to win some token of a time. And if you tend to be incoherent with the other juror, you're going to lose some token of a time. So even if you're honest, uh, sometimes you're going to disagree, that's fine. Uh, but if uh, you're uh, disagreeing way more than reasonable, uh, that's probably because you didn't do your job properly, uh, either because you did not spend enough time or uh, because you did not have the required skills. So okay. you have to seed the court, I would say, with a good juror. Uh, it's important to have the initial pool of juror actually uh, being, uh, being skillful. But then when some juror join, uh, if he does not have any skill, he's going to rule incrementally compared to the current juror who have uh, skills. And so he's going to lose money the first time. So either he can just withdraw and do something else, or he can learn and become better up to the point where he's skillful and uh, now he's way more coherent than he used to be and then he can continue uh, on this course. So no one is gonna like kick someone out in a binary way, uh, but over time, if you're incoherent, you lose tokens, so you lose chance of being drawn, so you're being drawn less and less. So it's basically the idea of a, a softer kick of, uh, of draw, which would not uh, uh, do their job properly. 
So when I'm a judge, I to get the money, it's better to judge together with the majority. Is that correct? Yeah, to the majority of the final ruling. So even if, for of example, you have three jurors and you vote A and the two other vote B, and then there is an appeal and uh, A is uh, the final result. In this case, uh, you're going to be the one uh, uh, who's going to be uh, rewarded, not the two other who voted B. Okay, okay. What, what do you think, Marco? It, it is, works. It actually works because sure. it's um, it's a it, it, the economic incentive is a way to keep people uh, on the line. Like I mean, um, to keep them straight with what they committed to do because it's a, it's a sort of a, a carrot and stick thing. Like you 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 promise that you will do that. Uh, I have means to understand if you're doing your job correctly, and and you have. Uh, um, um, price or a punishment depending on how you use uh, the opportunity that they gave you. Um, this is very, very uh, common in all the blockchain uh, industry. Uh, it actually what drives, for example, Bitcoin mining. Uh, and uh, it also, um, rather than just the mechanism, it's uh, mostly uh, depending on um, which type of behavior you want to push forward. And in this case, uh, the behavior is uh, try to think like a common person, like like uh, uh, what would um, the community decide? Um, which is uh, you might have your 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 own specific point of view, but you know that the, the specific situation you are judging is going to be looked by other people. So you don't have to take your judgments just based on what you think it's right for you, but you have to broaden your your uh, your point of view. And you have to th consider also other people' point, point of view in that. In the, in, and this is it's, uh, it's very interesting, very interesting actually. Uh, Clement, how how has it worked so far in, in the judgment made this system? Was it successful? Do you think there's something that you can improve? How how happy are you are you with the situation so far? The quality so the of judgment, I would say. So for the use cases we tried so far, it worked uh, really well, I would say. Um, of course, we should always uh, uh, plan uh, court, we should always plan rule. So because for the juror, we need to give them a set of rules on how to, to make ruling. Uh, and I think a lot of time, uh, if the rules are good, that's going to give you good result. Uh, perhaps sometimes even more than the juror. Sometimes the rules are maybe more important uh, than the people uh, applying them. Uh, but for now, I don't see any case where people could say, oh, no, like, jurors were wrong. Uh, obviously, sometimes there are cases which are, where there is disagreement. Sometimes you have stuff which are close to 40, 60, and you may have the 40% who say, no, no, that was a wrong ruling, and uh, that's bad. Uh, but that's, some, that's normal. Like, uh, there are always uh, edge cases where people are not completely agreeing on the result. Uh, but I don't think there have ever been a case where someone could say it was clearly a wrong ruling. So justice is actually being served because this is your outcome. That's your output, justice, right? Yeah, and, and, and it's working. It's what, what, automatically what, what, executed. So automatically when you get uh, yeah. a clear ruling, it's not just you get a paper and then you're like in the Alice and Bob, and then you go to Bob and say, "Oh, you scam me, give me my money back." Uh, well, in this case, Bob would have been run. I uh, would have run away for a long time. Uh, it's uh, under by smart contract. So if you have Alice, which is going to rent some place, uh, the money is locked in a contract. And is a juror rule to reimburse Alice, the money is unlocked back to Alice. And in normal cases, the money is going to be unlocked uh, uh, to Bob. So yeah. it's uh, like with smart contract, we have a self enforcing ruling, which are really interesting. Because the money is in the escrow and what the the jury do the, the they they vote for releasing the money or not basically and the money goes so it's not only as you're saying the judge says you are uh you are entitled to get some money from from her but the money actually goes immediately so it's judgment and execution yeah exactly so carol gives some ruling and then the application which is using carol decides what to do with it so in this case that's to move some money um, you can make a slightly more complex contract. Like you can also have Alice, which will need to put a security deposit. And in this case, you could have Bob, which claim part of the security deposit of Alice. Um, you can have dispute about uh, listing items. Still in the case of Alice and Bob, where Bob is making a, listing a fake property. 
uh, Alice could also uh, challenge this property where she would uh, request this property to be removed uh, from uh, this particular application so that other people uh, don't, uh, don't get scammed. Even if she got her money back, she's gonna arrive in a place and not have uh, any uh, housing for the night. So that's not, uh, not good. Um, you can perform any kind of action uh, depending uh, to a ruling. And I would say the three more common are moving some money, uh, are adding or removing item to a list. So list of property, for example. Uh, and um, the last one is uh, to report a result uh, of uh, the outside world. Uh, so now you could have some complex uh, contract, uh, which uh, states that in case of a uh, uh, force majeure, like an emergency world emergency, uh, you could be able to cancel your booking. Uh, and in this case, you could have a contract where someone can report uh, this uh, world emergency. In our case, that would be the coronavirus. Uh, and some people can challenge this report. And if uh, you have this report of the world emergency, automatically all the other contract can allow uh, the people who book to get uh, their money back. Uh, that's just an example. I'm not necessarily saying that we, we should specifically put this kind of rule, but that shows you like, the, the power and the, and the ability to create a uh, rule based on uh, outside events. That's the Oracle oh. uh, use case. Oh, the Oracle, yes. Uh, let's maybe go a bit later on the Oracle because I guess we're going to blow some minds here. Marco, in a recent video, you said something uh, which worried me a little bit uh, mm. about Ethereum smart, Ethereum smart contracts do not do anything automatically. Uh, oh. They don't, yes, so they don't get um they don't get instructions to make that yeah, there's not a clock for instance right so you cannot say exactly. at midnight do this etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh how, please explain this and tell me okay. if there's a limitation uh, on what we are dreaming here and especially about maybe you can explain oracles to people okay <laughs> which is like well it's just another level but yeah we have limits but that's what make it fun, right? If it was just a downslope and uh, we will just have all like this, it wouldn't be fun. So it, limits are there because they, you need them to study and to find a way to fix uh, the limitation and get to what you want nonetheless. Um, one of those limits is blockchain is very good at understanding and knowing what happens inside the blockchain. That's the reason why, for example, you can transfer Bitcoin from one wallet to another because the blockchain knows these transactions were, which was generated inside the blockchain and the Bitcoin were moving in between addresses inside of the blockchain and the Bitcoin themselves were born inside of the blockchain and never leave the blockchain. Um, one thing that blockchain are not that good at doing is understanding what happens outside. So, for example, um, the, the video you mentioned before was uh, a sort of a reply for, for uh, things that are being taught to uh, lawyers and everything that is concerning the, the, the world of law. Because um, what I see, especially here in Italy, is that uh, there are lawyers which are not technicians, they do not understand coding, they do not understand how blockchain works, that Here's something and go tell other lawyers how blockchain is supposed to work. But actually, this most of the time is based on what they think it should be or what they would like it to be, not what is real. Uh, thing is, blockchain does not know what happens outside uh, as a rule. You, there's always the need for somebody to tell the blockchain what is happening outside. For, so for example, for a smart contract at the moment, you don't have the opportunity to say, this transaction has to start uh, if uh, tomorrow rains. You have no way to, to tell this. So you need to have something that is actually giving instructions to the blockchain or giving information to the smart contract inside the blockchain. And once you have the information, then maybe the, the smart contract can make a decision depending on the code. But the weak point here, the weak link is who is the guy that is putting this information inside the blockchain for us? Because uh, as I said before, you, you, you don't trust, you verify. The, the, the motto of this community is don't trust, verify. So you don't trust the guy that is supposed to say to the smart contract if uh, tomorrow is going to rain or if yesterday it did rain or not. Um, because this brings you back to have a platform that is trust-based because even if you have just a small link of one guy that is giving information to the smart contract, then all the platform is going to be based on trust, on the trust on the specific guy. So the issue here is how do we find a way to transfer information in a secure manner 
having the accountability of the people that are actually giving this information and a way to ensure that this information is secure. Imagine if you have a smart contract that is dealing with the price of gold or Bitcoin and is moving enormous amount of money for trading, for finance or other. If you find a way to hack this element that is bringing the price of gold or Bitcoin inside the blockchain, because by the way, Bitcoin blockchain doesn't even know how much value is a single Bitcoin because it's not his business. So the point is, if you find a way to hack that single point, then you hack the whole platform. And by the way, this is a way that uh, some of the most famous hack in blockchain were, were carried out. Um, so the thing is, there are different ways to uh, try to do something similar to, to what Clement did, meaning that you don't trust one guy. You want to have, let's say, 5, 10, 15 different guys that have to give you the same information coming from different corners of the world in a way that are they are completely split apart in an order to in which you can um, uh, reasonably think that they cannot collude in order to give you all the same false information in order to fool you. Uh, those guys are called oracles. And this is a very interesting field of study. Um, both under the uh, application point of view, but also under the academic point of view, meaning uh, cryptography and all other mechanisms that allows this process to happen in a secure way. Um, your case, for example, uh, is uh, um, could be I don't know. You, you need an oracle to say uh, which was the uh, was the, did the hotel actually there. So it, you 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 can take a picture of the hotel to see if it was a hotel or if it was just a, a gas pump. Uh, but the, uh, the blockchain is not able to understand the difference between a gas pump and a hotel. So you need to provide a set of information in order for the blockchain to, to decide. The blockchain cannot decide. That's why you need, like in your case, uh, a, a set of people that is in charge for doing that. Okay, so if the people actually vote, they can send the instruction to this market. Exactly. And, and also, at this point, you know, you have people voting for this, but you, you just have another problem. How can you ensure that people will be honest at doing this? And how Clement explained us before, there are different ways in which you can uh, bring people I'm, I'm to correct. Sorry to interrupt you. You gave, me, you gave me an amazing example here, an amazing idea. Cancellation policies have been a big issue with the coronavirus. We, you know, everybody's angry with Airbnb because they gave, they gave the money back to the guests, et cetera, et cetera. But with this system, we could envision a hotel on the beach which says, mm -hmm. okay, you have the standard 100 euro a night booking and with a cancellation policy which is a week before or you pay 150 but if it rains you get the money back and the rain can be th this event of the rain could be connected to the oracle which exactly. reads the internet because the, the weather is one of the easiest ones to read on the internet like exactly 90 percent of weather channels say it's raining it's raining and you get the money automatically back not even like somebody's clicking a button or, or making a judgment, you just get the money back at 10 a.m. of the same day because it's raining. And you can appeal to the decision maybe through Clarus. Could yeah. that something that they work? Uh, it might. We might even try to make a startup out of this because, for example, you could have different uh, uh, people like um, if you have uh, uh, media stations, uh, or you might uh, try to have uh, people that are running webcams on the street and to see if they, at the time, it was actually raining and have some artificial intelligence trying to understand if the weather was rainy or it was sunny. Uh, the, 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 the key factor here is having different people with different types of information uh, that cannot be all connected artificially together unless they are all telling the truth. So it, the, the thing is, is very simple here. You, you ask different questions to different people, but they, in the end, they all have to match. So they all have to tell you it was sunny or it was raining. So you, you can ask the weather, you can see, um, you, you can even try to have different monitors that actually don't give you the straight information, but something similar. So suppose there, there is a river and you have a way to measure the height of the river of the water. Uh, so you know that if there was more water, it was more likely that it was raining than if it was less water, probably it was sunny. So you are using a, a, not a direct approach to the information. You are trying to get to the same information in a different way. And the key here is, it's not possible to cheat on all the different channels at the same time in order to try to fool the guest or the, or the host. That, that's that's mind-blowing. Uh, going back to the COVID-19 problem and the cancellations in Airbnb, what Airbnb did was 
practically they overwrote the rules. The cancellation policy was, mm. for instance, you can cancel until a month before, and, and if it's less than a month, you get 50% back, that's it. But Airbnb decided to give all the money back to all the guests, and it basically killed companies and property managers and hosts who were expecting money for the season and they lost it. But we can debate if that was right or not, depending if you're a guest or a host, I'm sure we have different approaches, but they over, so a company overwrote an agreement. Uh, in the same situation on a blockchain booking, play, booking portal or even in direct booking or whatever, but if the smart contract is the, taking the decisions, the smart contract wouldn't do that. You will get your money. Then of course, there could be an appeal. Because the guests could say, yeah, okay, you got the money because, you know, the, the, the time has passed, but there was a pandemic. So you would have judges taking care of this. So I'm just trying to envision how a decentralized platform would have dealt with this. Uh, probably better than how it's been dealt today by, by Airbnb, basically. So it's really, it's really interesting. Okay. Um, I don't have questions right now. Right. Well, just uh, to give you an idea, yeah. the, the, the yeah. advantage here with using a smart contract is that if you write a smart contract and you deploy that smart contract, it stays there forever and you cannot change it. Uh, so if the code is meant to be unchangeable, in a reasonable meaning, uh, then uh, if the policy and the, the contract that you have with the with Airbnb was you have one month to, to cancel, they cannot overwrite it. Also because it's already running on his in his own leg, so you cannot stop it from, from running. And that's the beauty of the smart contract. So uh, it's rigid, you cannot change it. Uh, this is a, a value in some cases like the one that you stated, but it might be uh, a bit too strict in other situations. So uh, you can either, either have a more flexible smart contract and you have to take care of how this flexibility is used, or you have a smart contract that works in that specific way, and then you, 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 you pair the, the smart contract with some other uh, instrument that can allow you to, to balance things. Uh, but one thing for sure, if you're using a blockchain, you cannot rewrite history, you cannot rewrite things. So if the agreement was that, uh, it was rain, pandemic, uh, or whatever, uh, sorry, that was the contract and it was, uh, uh, each of the party could say, I was exposed to risk A, and the other can say, I was to exposed to risk non-A. So it, every, both of the sides are taking risk when they are writing a contract. And the smart contract simply enforces what they agree upon. The, the smart contract is a hard promise, yeah. while your agreement with the OTA is a soft promise. It's, it's, it's like this until we say it's like this. So it, it changes the things because if I'm a guest and I know that's a hard promise and nobody can actually give me the money back, maybe I take a travel insurance. Exactly. Maybe. Okay. So it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. Okay. I'm sure that for the next five years, this sounds all very nice, but we're going to make horrible mistakes because before this gets to a level where it's better than what we have today, we're going to go through horrible mistakes. Clement, do you, like, are you foreseeing mistakes and problems? What can go wrong? Because, you know, it's nice to talk about how the future is going to be bright, but let's also talk about the po possible wrong, you know, wrong decisions taken or what can go wrong in your opinion in general, or if you want specifically on, on these kind of transactions, like booking. Bookings. Yeah, so there is always the risk uh, of hacking. Um, smart contracts, if they are done well, uh, like, they should, like if the smart contract is coded well, it won't be able to be hacked. Uh, but uh, you man need to write them, so you man make mistakes, and sometimes you have smart contract vulnerabilities, and hacker uh, can uh, exploit that. Um, another kind of challenge that we are currently facing right now is a uh, blockchain scalability. It's a quite new challenge, I would say. Uh, because in most of the history of blockchain, uh, the bottleneck has always been users and not technology. Uh, but now where blockchain is developing so fast and getting so much uh, adoption compared to what it used to have, uh, we are seeing that uh, making transactions on it uh, tend to cost more and more uh, because uh, there are more and more people to wanting to make transactions. It's basically uh, offer uh, and demand uh, to use the chain. Um, fortunately, that should be fixed with uh, scalability solution, 
but that's still a challenge which need to be over overcome uh, before we have uh, this uh, huge uh, worldwide uh, use uh, of, uh, of blockchain technology. And then there is also that uh, at, at the end of the day. So, sorry, let me, inter let me interrupt you here because uh, most people won't know what we're talking about. Uh, when you say costs, you, you're referring probably to the gas cost, right? Yeah, so, I'm referring to gas yeah, cost. Correct? Yeah. Okay. So uh, just to explain to people, uh, what, what's happening here is that when I have to pass a judgment, I click a button and I'm paying the smart contract to do this thing. And I have to pay some gas, which is some little money usually, to the network. Okay. Nobody pays for, ser pays for servers. The service is the network. So um, I'm pay how much are you paying when you're judging today in, uh, in Kleros? Today, I know it's very high today because of speculation and, and DeFi, um, and we'll talk about this maybe later, but how much is it? Like, maybe how much something is like case? 20 to 50 cents when you're making a ruling. So every single judge pays this money or the whole ruling? Yeah, no, no, every single judge. So if I have five judges, it's three or four dollars, three or four euros, plus the money for the judges. Because the judges get, make also money, right? Yeah, but keep in mind that it's uh, some uh, specific problem that we are facing right now. Uh, when Carol's lunch, uh, we could uh, make that for uh, uh, like a, a few, one, two, three cents, something like that. So how much will it be today to judge an Airbnb case, sorry, an Airbnb, a booking platform case with five judges? Just to give you an idea, 10 euros enough? Um, if you count uh, what is paid to the judges? Yeah. Everything. Everything. So if you want five judges, you're probably going to want to pay, I don't know, perhaps $4 each. So you may pay something like $20 plus uh, three dollar of gas cost, so it may be something like twenty-three dollar. So if, uh, if we're talking about a transaction which is worth five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, it's not too bad, right? Then it happens once in a while; it doesn't happen on every single one. It doesn't look expensive. I know, I just like uh, comparing actually, to hiring even, people and having a whole service, right? Actually, even if it's a five dollar transaction, uh, that's still good. So that may seem paradoxical. Uh, but because you can uh, put the cost of arbitration on the party which is going to lose the case, uh, so you can ask both parties to deposit the arbitration cost and the winning party, you reimburse the arbitration cost uh, to this party. So in this case, if you know that you're going to lose, you're not going to put the money in the first place. So in the example of Alice and Bob, uh, well, Bob knows that he's going to lose. He knows he did not make, uh, like his listing was fake. So he's not going to put arbitration fees and Alice is going to get her money back automatically. Okay, Marco, what can go wrong? So hacking for uh, sloppy code? Uh, users, users usually are the, 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 the main source of every kind of problem that happens. Okay, we, we, we agree on one thing. We should eliminate every human being and everything would be great. That's what every programmer thinks. But uh, uh, since we can't go, we can't get there yet. We're still here as humans, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, what, what could users do wrong and how can we you know, mitigate this problem? Uh, well, let's see. Generally, the thing is, um, there was this funny video uh, which dates about 25, 30 years ago. There was this couple who was interviewed by the television and say, well, if sending an email is very easy. You just have to get your phone, get your modem, melt them together, plug the key, run this program, start this other server, that, deal this number, put this password. It, it, it was a procedure that lasted about 15 minutes just in order to send an email, which is something that now we do with, with one thumb on, on a device. We are still on that phase. Uh, using the blockchain is still a thing that uh, not many people understand. Um, it's very complex. Uh, just for um, for the example that we made, we said, "Well, I, I'm paying this uh, uh, this trip in in euros. I'm used I'm used to use my credit card. Now I have to start using um, uh, cryptocurrency. Then I have to buy cryptocurrency to pay for the trip, and I have also to buy this cryptocurrency to, to for for the for the judgment. Is uh, there is some litigation going on? And, and this is uh, two coins. Is just too much confusion because uh, what, which denomination do I use for the coins? The one in, in euros where, from my country, or or dollars, or or uh, 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 rubles from from Russia. If I'm going to uh, 
are hosting Russia. It, it, it's, it's a lot of confusion for the users. So the main issue that we are facing as technicians in this space is trying to make things as simple as possible. And it's a huge issue because um, you, you can't uh, dumb down complexity. Complexity is the key of blockchain. Uh, blockchain needs to be complex because the security of the blockchain lies in this complexity and in, in the different ways that it uh, can be used. But this does not mean that every single user needs to be an expert on blockchain to use a blockchain application like a, a DAP or a smart contract. So we need uh, clever programmers that are able to sort of um, hide the complexity behind a curtain and all of the, the, the user to have application running uh, very easily, very smoothly, uh, like if they could even ignore completely the fact that it's running on a blockchain because uh, that's what leads you to main adoption. And once you do that, if you do that also in a secure way, in a way which, which actually uh, somehow limits the possibility of the of the normal user to make mistakes, to, you, you avoid mistakes from the beginning, and that everything is going to be very, very smooth. But th this is still a challenge for, for us because uh, we are not there yet. Uh, we're getting there. Uh, we can see wallets that are very funny. They're, they're, they're like, they look like simple games. Uh, still, it's very serious because uh, if you are talking about uh, cryptocurrency, it's, it's real money. You know, they, they, they are stolen. They, 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 they try to steal them from you. So it, it's not a joke at all. So the thing is, make it easier, make it fun make it simple, but keep it secure. And as for the scalability and for the cost of gas, uh, there are um, probably different solutions already there out there. Because for example, um, what I envision is there are going to be different blockchain and different platforms and we will use uh, probably the one that fits most our needs. If you are talking about uh, money or a long-term investment or uh, um, a sort of a unicorn account, a store of value, you will probably go to, to Bitcoin and it makes absolutely no sense to go to any other. Uh, if you're talking smart contract, then you need to go to something that looks like uh, Ethereum or something that looks like Ethereum, but there are many flavors of Ethereum, for example. Uh, in, in Italy, we have Quadrants, which is made basically for business and the, the cost of the transaction is zero. It is very fast, it, but it starts from a different approach. Uh, like, for example, um, in business, in, in cryptocurrency, in blockchain, you want everybody to be pseudo-anonymous, like you don't have to show your face. But in a business situation, is this a requirement? Uh, no, usually not, because people want to know who they're making business with. So if you change a bit the space in which you are applying your specific application, a specific blockchain, then maybe you have different ways and the scaling and the cost is not that much uh, uh, an issue. It depends how which tool you use. Now we have few tools, we know how to use them and we try to use the same tool for everything. Uh, I think that as the time will go by, we'll have different tools and we will learn how to use the specific tool bet that better fits our needs. How many years? I mean, just give me a time frame here before this gets easy and cheap and mainstream. Let's say uh, three to five years. Okay, okay. That's oh. kind of my time frame too, yeah, of course. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, Clement, uh, how far are we from, I wanna be a judge for Claros in my life and do it from the beach, right? How far am I from having this on a smartphone? Uh, I don't need to get, you know, learn too much. I just hear about Claros, oh, I like this. I download the app or whatever, or, or a browser, and I start being a judge in a very easy way. How far are we from that in terms of, time let's say well if you already have crypto and already know the basics no of that, no that's already <laughs> no fair. no that's not no, fair if you don't if, know crypto <laughs> no if, if, if you don't have crypto uh well yeah maybe it may be awesome also i'm thinking two or three years uh to to get a really good user yeah. interface you know in origin protocol right they they decided to subside the, the, the gas cost so you download the app and you upload an apartment or uh whatever in in their app you don't even deal with the with the gas so you don't have to have ethereum so you don't have to go to coinbase or kraken or whatever you just download the app and you create a transaction you you upload a listing right uh that of course has, has some probably very high costs behind that um Maybe could Claros say like, okay, to join Claros, you have to pay a hundred euro with the credit card. 
and forget it. And behind the scenes, you buy the, the eater and you pay the gas for a certain time. Uh, is this a way for you, like hiding the, the necessity for gas? Is it a way you're thinking to make it onboarding easier? Or there's a lot of more complexity which doesn't allow this kind of, of movement? Or to turn the question differently, how do you plan to make it easier? Yeah, yeah. so there are some uh, projects of you just put some credit card and it's paying the gas for you and it's buying the crypto for you automatically. That's probably going to be live in something like uh, two to three years. But I'd argue that it's not that the blockchain is more complex uh, than the current financial system. It's that it's different. So you, think, you, you may think that, oh, using a credit card, uh, having uh, this passcode and then having to go into my phone to validate the payment and to get a specific pin and sometimes to get a, a card uh, where I have some lot of number in the card and I need to find the number in this particular position. Uh, like actually that's even more complex than what you're doing in blockchain. It's just that be, we've been used to it gradually. Like it started with a credit card, with a code, well, in some countries, they still don't have code, like in the US. Uh, and then after all, they added this, oh, you need to validate this on your uh, phone. And then they had, oh, no, you need this specific card and find a, uh, a specific number on this card. And it was added one by one. So at the end, people still kind of managed to, to do it. Uh, but now, when you're going to get the next generation, when you're like people who are perhaps 15 uh, right now, and well, they're going to be 18, they may start uh, doing stuff with crypto. And then you're gonna tell them, oh no, to make a, an international wire transfer, uh, you need to go to this bank in this particular place with your ID and wait in the, and take a ticket and wait in the queue. They're gonna be, what? I need to move to a place to move money? And they're gonna look you like, that's so like a, a previous century kind of technology. Uh, so I think there is both. There is making the uh, user experience as smooth as possible, but even when the user experience is better than the current financial system, people may still find it harder because they are not used to it. Uh, but when we're gonna get people who are, how we say, crypto native, uh, they're gonna find the user experience way better than the current uh, experience. Yeah, yeah, once you are in it, once you've done the onboarding, which as you say, is not easier in the banks, it's, I mean, we just did it already. So we forgot about how painful it was and how painful it is to open a bank account, etc. Then it's actually much, much easier. I mean, it's going to be 100 times easier than today's situation. So, yeah, we may wait for people to learn. But at the same time, as you say, we, we should also make it easier. So we're going to get there. It's just a question of time. Uh, we don't have much time left. But uh, so... In our specific use case, so heavy, and this is an, actually we're talking to the industry here who often doesn't believe what I'm talking about. It's like decisions about booking disputes, will, will they be made by a network instead of by a company? Uh, can this work? Marco first, maybe? Absolutely. It will work. Um, not only. Um, as you said before, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of legal guys in this moment and they are freaking out because what I tell them is that one day all our rights and our possibility will not be dictated by the fact that there's, there's some piece of paper written by some guy that say you can do this or you can do that because this is a very weak form of um, protection of my rights. Uh, an algorithm with a strong encryption, with strong mathematics is far more trustable than any piece of paper. So when we will have um, a form of, uh, say, uh, let's, I, I call it algorithm, algorithmic uh, rights, meaning that if, if, I, if I own my, my, my Bitcoins, my Ether, my Crips token, they are mine because the math says so, and nobody can take them away from me. And I don't need any state, law, or other thing to enforce my right because they are enforced by hard mathematics. And this is going to uh, be a, a, a huge change brought by the blockchain. This thing is going to literally change the world. And we are just starting to see the tip of the iceberg of the things that are going to change. And I am convinced that we, we, we don't even realize 
how many things are going to change and how much? Um, what you just said, uh, normally I use the word uh, rule of law. Like today's internet is medieval. It's, it's feudalistic. Like there's big, big kings, you know, Amazon or Google or YouTube or Airbnb. And we are just there, you know, until they decide we are not there anymore. Uh, once we, once the rules are enforced by smart contracts, we make this passage to the rule of law where the law is clear and it's applied unregarding, you know, who has more power. And uh, so it's going to be like the internet catches up with the real world. While in the meantime, the real world loses the rule <laughs> of law and goes in authoritarian <laughs> systems, but that's another story. So Clement, I think what you're doing is of, of huge importance. Is there anybody else trying to do something like this or you are the only one? Well, there was some other competing project, uh, which, well, most of them are already dead. Uh, there is one project which uh, made a copy of what we've done, but even if uh, they, they have a court, they don't have an ecosystem. Uh, by, I mean, like there is no application which are uh, using them. So yeah, like, that's something which is really important. So obviously there will be multiple people trying to work on that. Uh, but for now, I, there is no like a, a clear, huge competitor uh, which, uh, which would be there. But we are still early, so. So, okay, but it's important. I'm asking because as much as I like your project, it's, if this competition is better for, for the old ecosystem, even for you. So, yeah, yeah, you're probably expecting some more coming up in the next years, like when the game changes and there's much more money involved or whatever. Yeah, we can have competition, but like for now, I think the, I would say uh, the most uh, fierce competition is a project uh, implementing their own dispute resolution system, more uh, than having general purpose dispute resolution system competing with Keros. So internal, develop this internally. I, I think okay. internal development are the highest, uh, like the uh, most dangerous, not necessarily dangerous, but uh, are the most fierce competition to, to Keros, and, not other And project. you are open source, so they could just copy your code. Yeah, Keros is open source, yeah. Okay, so they can how copy do you... the code, but they cannot copy yeah. the community, they cannot copy the ecosystem, they cannot copy the list of applications which are already connected to Keros. So there are some network effects which cannot be copied. Yeah. Yeah, because you are the first mover here. Okay, when we were in Milan, because actually I haven't said that, we, we met the, the three of us in Milan and we presented at this conference, Icon. Um, we discovered, well, you gave us some tokens, actually. Um, we discovered about Uni, Uniswap, which is this decentralized exchange where you told us we could buy your tokens and you gave us also some tokens, remember? And uh, I think they tripled in price since since december uh which made us all of us very happy uh just to close this this conversation guys with the news right DeFi, DeFi is the centralized finance is the everybody's talking i mean everybody in our world of nerds we are just zero one percent of population but in blockchain DeFi is the big thing people are moving coins tokens all around uh could you like give me your feedback uh marco and first about what's happening with DeFi and what do you think about this? Okay, DeFi is basically changing the way that finance works, applying blockchain and basically tokens to it. Um, and this is, uh, this is huge because we saw in, in a, a rush of uh, resources of money running to the uh, different smart contract application or the centralized finance application. Uh, when people made a lot of money out of it. Like we, you said before, in 2017, we had this ICO thing. Now the thing for uh, 2019 and 2020 is the, the DeFi. Uh, people made very easily 9%, 10%, even more in a few months. And this is because the finance world is looking at the blockchain because actually, as you said before, it's hard in the beginning, but it makes a lot of things easier. It makes a lot of things faster. And they are basically um, reinventing themselves in this new world. So they are, they are, they are basically um, presenting the same financial products that they have in the, the financial world inside the blockchain. And they make it through uh, smart contracts and, um, and tokens. Um, it's huge. 
uh, if it started like skyrocketing, I think that it would, of course, it would not last like this for a long time. Uh, I see it's already starting to slow down. Probably it will get to a point where it gives you the same results that you have with traditional finance. But the nice thing here is that it's, it's harder for people to run away with the money if you have the possibility, like uh, cleverly Clement said, like um, making your smart contract uh, public in, in open source so everybody can check what you're doing. They cannot, um, they should not fear because basically they can check. This is the, the, the difference. Like uh, while we had a, a, a few problems like 2008 and so on when the, the finance was actually uh, all set up on, on, on hopes and backed by faith and uh, there was nothing there. Here you can see actually the code that is moving everything. So um, there is still a lot of risk. There are still platforms that are very centralized, even if they call decentralized finance. They are, if you actually look closely, most of those are very centralized. So you have to be extremely careful. Uh, but it is interesting to see that uh, a very specific word like finance is moving to blockchain because simply they are saying it works. That this is this is the tool. This is the way that you can work with. Could you suggest one decentralized, uh, you know, DEX uh, exchange which is decentralized for real? Mm, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid that I could tell something that I might regret it in a few hours. Oh, so so okay. I prefer not. Okay, okay. No, because the last tweet, Twitter discussion, like Uniswap was pretty clean, but many others were not. Yeah, so. yeah, but a, a lot yeah. of them are. A lot of yeah, them yeah. are. Uh, the thing is that what what I always say and basically what I also have to say is try to educate yourself as much as possible, try to understand this thing as much as possible, make your own decision, uh, try to find information in uh, from uh, open and trusted uh, sources that you can verify so that you want, once you have the capability to verify, you don't have to trust anymore. And after that, you can make your own decision on what is better for you, what will your portfolio, the amount of money, the, 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 your uh, personal exposition to risk that you can take and always remember the mantra, invest only what you are ready to lose because it can happen. Okay, great, Marco. Uh, Clement, do you see any uh, opportunities in DeFi for you? Oh, yeah, like uh, we, we spoke about uh, travel, but DeFi also have uh, their need of, uh, of dispute resolution. So recently, uh, we've seen uh, Omen, which is a prediction market launching, where you can uh, buy, share of an outcome, so you could buy share of uh, it's gonna rain on this particular date or it's not gonna rain. And if it's raining on this date, uh, each of your share will redeem for $1. And if it's not raining, uh, the share will not redeem for anything. So you can use it for a few different purposes. Uh, one could be to set up an insurance where you're making a festival. So you're gonna buy a lot of shares of uh, it's uh, gonna rain because in this way if it rains as a tax as an insurance uh, and you're not bankrupt even if, if, even if your festival is cancelled and you can also use it as a, a prediction tool so you don't really know if it's gonna rain or not you're gonna put a bit of liquidity on both sides and you're gonna let people trade on it and the market is gonna value shares of yes to 10 percent uh, to 10 cents and shares of no to 90 cents uh, so from that, you can get the probability and you can see, okay, according to the market, there is 10% chance that it's going to rain. Uh, so it's not that crazy. So maybe I can put my festival on this particular date. So that's really interesting to either gather information uh, or uh, to act uh, as a de facto uh, insurance. And on that, we have this need of, or of Oracle uh, and uh, we have Claros connected to that to be able to um, give the outcome of the event uh, which are uh, predicted. When oh, so you're, you're basically paying people to think and to, to place bets and you, what you're actually buying is, is their work and time and analysis on a specific thing, which is, which is really great. Okay. So if you're, if you're putting liquidity and, as, uh, and expecting to lose it, yes. But you can also put liquidity because you think you're going to uh, actually earn money uh, depending of, uh, of the liquidity fee that you, you, you will charge. I, prediction market is really, uh, I would say, uh, a, a really basic tool that can be used for a lot of things. 
So one guy may use it uh, just to bet on a sport, for example. That's also like that, that includes betting, that includes insurance, uh, that includes predicting the future. Uh, prediction market is a basic uh, tool that has so many use cases. Amazing. Okay. Our time is up. Uh, it was very, very interesting and very challenging. Um, I mean, this opens su such a series of scenarios, which is, is just like too much to, 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 to digest in one day, especially if people listening come from, you know, I haven't been exposed yet to blockchain and maybe they thought blockchain is just this Bitcoin thing, which is making people rich or, you know, it's much more than that. And there's so much going on behind the scenes but when, or I prefer to say under, under the surface, when this gets out, you better be prepared because this is going to change everything as Marco says. And, and our job here is to actually educate our industry because we need this, but uh, you know, it's, it's, and, and it, most people don't really know what we're talking about. So thank you so much guys for giving us uh, a glimpse into the future, literally. And uh, I hope we didn't give too much. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I'm gonna link all your your websites in the in the YouTube video. And hope to see you soon, sometime in the future. Thank you very much, Luca, thank for you. having us. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye.